Water is an imperative component of sustaining life on Earth. Much of human history has been shaped around finding ways to ensure access to clean water. From the Indus Valley's irrigation, to the Roman aqueducts, to indoor plumbing, to treated water supplies, humans have recognized the importance of focusing and investing in better ways to manage water. In today's Iowa, we can have almost instantaneous access to clean water for drinking, bathing, recreation, appliance use, and just about anything else we want to do with it. After over 3,000 years of perfecting water distribution, nothing could hurt our ability to access clean water, right? The Des Moines Water Works Board made it official tonight. They're going to file a federal lawsuit against three Iowa counties, accusing those governments of violating the Clean Water Act. Water Works claims those counties aren't doing enough to keep nitrates from farm runoff out of the Raccoon River. And the utility says it spent about $1.5 million last year cleaning that water by removing nitrates. Now it is approved close to that same amount to fight this lawsuit. Des Moines Water Works is taking three Iowa counties to court over claims of polluted drinking water. From SAC, Buena Vista and Calhoun counties caused high nitrate levels downstream. Water Works wanted those counties to pay for the expense of removing the nitrates once they hit Des Moines. The Iowa Supreme Court took that possibility off the table today, saying the counties are immune from financial damages. Farmers are, are sort of on the hot seat, especially now with this lawsuit in Iowa. It created a little more awareness amongst the farmers. It also created a lot more resentment amongst rural Iowa and the metro area here. But this is not just a rural issue. It's also uh, communities, and we need to look at it from a watershed perspective. To me, it was a shot in the dark. Quite frankly, my, my feeling of it is the Morning Water Works is looking for someone to pay for updating the facilities. Now, one of the dilemmas we have is farmers upstream get no benefit, direct benefit, from them spending the money on those, those practices. When there's harm done, we need to pay for it, and there's a tremendous amount of harm done. When I was young, my dad farmed. I remember being a kid and being on the farm and I loved it. You, you talk to, to most any farmer, farming's a passion. Most of us that do it, it's a passion for us and, and it's something we love. We have a love of the land, so to say. Brian Meyer is a farmer in Northeast Iowa that is making strides to protect Iowa's natural resources. Like many local farmers in Iowa, Meyer is frustrated with the recent Des Moines Water Works lawsuit and wants people to become more knowledgeable about agriculture before fingers are pointed and blame is placed. I thought it was ridiculous. We talked about it at, at our Agribusiness Association of Iowa because it, it's quite a concern for us uh, as, as far as being in, in the agriculture business in Iowa, but also for me as an individual farmer, you know, it's more than just agriculture. There's natural nitrogen occurring just out of organic matter in the soils. Being a certified crop advisor, Meyer has to stay up to date with conservation practices so he can educate other farmers about what they can do to help with issues like water quality. I as a CCA see my response, as a you know, certified crop advisor, I see my responsibility being to help that farmer manage his, his inputs to be effective, cost effective, and also environmentally effective. I look at my job when I deal with my clients and customers the same way I do at my own farm operation. Minimize inputs, maximize yields, and, and, you know, and, and help maximize profits. Um, it's, a, it's a hard balance to work out. Meyer has been implementing conservation practices into his own farming operation long before the Des Moines Water Works lawsuit took place. These practices help both with soil conservation and water quality which Meyer says go hand in hand. So I've been farming since 1989, so it's 27 years now. This will be my, my 27th crop this year. Out of them 27 years, I've been no-tilling quite regularly for probably the last 20 years. And I've also, just in the last three years, I've incorporated the cover crop into it also, which I think there's a lot, I've seen benefits to it, which is gonna make me continue to do it and hopefully expand some more on it. According to the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy Report, cover crops are said to block the vast majority of nutrients from leaving the land. There were fewer than 40,000 acres of cover crops in 2011. Now there's nearly 400,000. While usage grew, the Environmental Working Group says still only 2.6% of Iowa farmland currently uses cover crops. Any nitrogen that's left over, any, any, um, any fertilizers that are left over that's soluble, they'll, 
they'll attach it to it, grab it, and they'll hold it in place so it, so it doesn't leach out or run away. And, and the biggest one with this is nitrogen, of course. That's what we're trying to really hold in place. Nitrogen will move in the soil. So if we can hold the nitrogen from leaching away, that's what, this, that's what these plants will do. I know, I know if I would farm it the way it was farmed years ago, I'd, I'd be losing topsoil because it would wash. And that's, again, that's what we're trying to prevent from happening. One of the main arguments of the lawsuit was that farm field runoff causes high nitrate levels in the Raccoon River. Meyer says the amount of fertilizer he uses has overall slightly decreased, even though the inputs vary depending on the crop. Following soybeans like this, we put on a range anywhere from 135, depending, depending on the soil and depending on the yield, the yield potential of the, of the ground. We'll put anywhere from 135 up to 170 units on. Michael Lubers, a soil conservation technician from the Natural Resources Conservation Service, says farmers are still applying too much fertilizer on their fields, and doing so reverses their previous conservation efforts. You're healing the system when you go to no-till cover crops, but anything over 100 pounds per acre essentially nukes the soil, kills everything. So the bacteria that's left, dead. So it, you're going one step forward and five steps back, and you're not going in the right direction. If you can reduce your inputs, which are constant, are increasing, you know, so they're really high. You know, fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, genetically modified, those cost quite a bit. And when you get your soil healthy, you zero out all of those budget items. The slant of conventional agriculture, they're not fixes. You have to address the soil, you know, every square inch, every square millimeter of soil has to be healed. We leak 60% of what we put on in fertilizer only 40% at best actually gets into your plant. And that's something that they'll never tell you, the chemical dealers, that majority of the chemicals, the inorganic fertilizers, leak out of the system. Well, nobody wants to put inputs out here, you know, waste fertilizer dollars when they know they're not gonna get a return for it, you know, because what, what's the point? There's no room to be wasting money out here in the agriculture. I mean, the bottom lines are so close right now, and there's a lot of guys that last year have been running in the red. But you can see, you know, the amount of money that's made through this agrochemical system is huge. They have a vested interest to make sure that they keep it going. They have a vested interest that we have all kinds of conservation programs. And that's kind of just to keep the current system in place. The lawsuit brought up the discussion of federal regulation of conservation practices, which had the possibility of increasing costs for farmers. We're more than happy to work with conservation services, but the mandating is not the way, you know, with the heavy hand to put it on. It usually doesn't work as well as having volunteer programs available to them. Because the lawsuit was dismissed, the regulation of conservation didn't happen. But the lawsuit was able to increase awareness and improve the focus of water quality in Iowa for everyone involved, farmers, scientists, lawmakers, and everyday Iowans. As you can see, it also created countercurrents among people working to protect water as a resource in Iowa and farmers working to sustain it within their operations. Some farmers just, they, you know, they've settled into what they're doing and they like what they're doing, but most farmers are looking at ways to always improve, improve their bottom line, improve their practices. I think most farmers are quite advocated by industry and by peers to keep up with the farming practices to preserve soil and do a good job of conservation. Well, today I'm here to talk to um, agribusinesses, students, farmers about um, water quality, soil health, uh, financial assistance programs for conservation, um, all those types of things uh, who are interested. For the most part, most farmers are doing a really good job across Iowa, but there can always be more done. There can always be more nutrient management. There can always be more cover crops, less tillage, those sort of things. Typically farmers are kind of stuck in their ways and if it's, it's, it's working for them, why change it? We have to be very delicate with farmers because this is their livelihood, this is their business. So we can't go in and tell them what they have to do. All the conservation practices that we promote are voluntary and most conservation in Iowa is voluntary. It took us 50 years of cultural practices and using fertilizers and, and crop protection products, 50 years before we started to realize, wait a minute, we're starting to contribute to an issue out here that exist that we have to correct. Well, we're conscientious of it, you know, water quality is important to us too, you know, because like I said, we have more gener, I mean, we want our kids to be around to be able to farm in this, you know, in this beautiful state of Iowa also. Dr. Emily Stanley at Wisconsin, a few years ago, I was uh, at a conference and she had a breakdown of that. She estimated 48% of the problem was agriculture. 
but the rest is wildlife, construction, golf courses, humanity, right? I mean, it's, we're all part of this and contribute a little bit. So we, it's like recycling or anything else. We have to do our own part and pretty soon it'll add up. So it's not just farmers that have a role in um, addressing water quality, it's communities and across the state and all of us, no matter where we live, have a uh, responsibility to make sure that we leave this land and the waters better than we found them. Dismissal of the lawsuit doesn't dismiss the need for funding, accountability, and solutions when it comes to water quality in Iowa. From farm field runoff to water treatment facilities, ensuring clean drinking water is an essential priority for our future. But when it comes to this water quality issue, there is no one villain. Everyone is to blame for impairing Iowa's water, yet they are working as they know how to protect and improve Iowa's water quality. Farmers walk the line between sustaining their farms and keeping water clean. Scientists and lawmakers work to protect water as a natural resource. Before you cast all the blame on farmers, remember this, farming is only the third most potent threat to water quality in Iowa. Per acre, golf courses are the most destructive force to water quality in the state. Second is the chemicals and fertilizers used by everyday households for lawn care. We are all at fault for contaminating Iowa's water with nitrates, whether it be farm fields, golf courses, or even our own lawns. Everyday Iowans may not even realize that they contribute to this problem. Now that you know, what can you do to help make Iowa's water cleaner? Thank you.